Good afternoon. Welcome to Sports Nothing But Sports with Kent Sterling for Monday, September 23rd, 2019. Brought to you by the great people at Today's Dentistry and Dr. Mike O'Neill. I'm telling you, I've been a patient there for 25 years. I've never been happier with these people. They're phenomenal at what they do. Give them a call. Trust your teeth to Dr. Mike O'Neill and his entire staff. 317-849-2900. 3-3, the Indianapolis Colts, a three-point win yesterday. That combined with a two-point win the, the week before and then losing by six the previous week, they've got a point differential of minus one. That's no big deal. I don't really care about that kind of stuff. What I do care about, Malik Hooker, he's going to be down for four to six weeks with a torn meniscus in his knee. That's where the meniscus is. So Malik Hooker is going to be out at free safety, and the Colts are going to have to find a way to replace him back there, have somebody else keep a lid on the defense. You saw what Malik Hooker does. And I know people get a little bit down on Malik Hooker because he's got one pick this year. He's been injured a lot in his career. But you know what else he does? He does the dirty work necessary to keep the ball in front of him and make sure that receivers don't get really deep. Matt Ryan had to dink and dunk and dink and dunk. The Falcons, they were down by three scores in the second half. And so because they had to dink and dunk, they ran a lot of clock. They had one drive that took nine minutes and 56 seconds. That's the Malik Hooker effect. If you don't have Malik Hooker back there, then you open yourself up to some big plays. Those big plays, the Colts, they avoided yesterday, and that's really the reason they won the game. It it wasn't the superiority of that defense. Let's talk about the defense for a minute because, uh, I, you know what, there's a lot of focus on Jacoby Brissett right now on talk radio, and I get it. You know, this Brissett versus Luck kind of comparative thing, which I think is completely invalid, but it's interesting to compare what Andrew Luck would be and what Jacoby Brissett is. I get it, but it's that defense, man. In the second half yesterday, the Atlanta Falcons had the ball three times. They scored three touchdowns. Uh, Matt, Matt Ryan, he was 21 of 22 throwing the football in the second half. On third down conversions, the Atlanta Falcons were nine for nine in the second half. Time of possession, they held the ball for 18 minutes and 55 seconds. And if not for that, that's kind of that bend, don't break defense. You know, and that's really, like I said, that's the way that the Colts won this game. They forced the Falcons to eat clock. Now, it would have been nice if their offense could have eaten a little bit of clock, but that first drive of the second half, that was a three and out. Then they held the ball a little bit, they scored a touchdown, and then at the end of the game, they held on because Frank Reich is pretty damn clever, and I like Frank Reich a lot, and you could tell last year, when you saw Frank Reich's offense, all of a sudden, instead of thinking, and this is kind of a visceral thinking uh, thought, rather than, you know, like, okay, let's break down the game film. As you were watching, anybody can break down the game film after the game. But as you're watching live, you really thought, okay, we're watching a guy who understands his offense. He understands the defense that he's playing against, and he's a step ahead of them. You could just feel that. You could feel the smarts from Frank Reich as he called play after play. And the other thing that I really like about Frank Reich is that he trusts his players to win the game. You got two kinds of coaches. You got the kind like Frank Reich who trusts the players to win the game. And then you have the kind of guy who tries to win despite his players. He tries not to lose because of his players, right? Tries not to have put them in a position where they could make mistakes. This is an aggressive coach who's got confidence in his guys. And on the offensive end, they're really good. On the defensive end, man, without Darius Leonard yesterday, they were not good at all. And Devonta Freeman, man, he ran roughshod over the Indianapolis Colts. And then you combine that with Ridley and Julio Jones and Hooper and Matt Ryan in the second half. And holy crap, that offense for the Falcons made the defense for the Colts look ridiculous. Now you got the win. So we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. But if somehow or another they had gotten the ball one more time in that second half, do you think that there was a chance in the world that the Colts were going to be able to stop the Falcons? Hell no. They were not going to be able to stop the Falcons. The Falcons had the Colts' defense's number in that second half. 
And what Matt Eberflus has got to do, Matt Eberflus has got to get aggressive. And you've got to get pressure on Matt Ryan. This coming week, you've got to get pressure on Derek Carr. If you don't do that, especially without Malik Hooker in that lineup, you are going to have trouble stopping that Raiders offense from scoring with gash plays. All right? You can't have it. You got to put pressure. And if you can't get pressure with four, then you got to get pressure with five. And if you can't get pressure with five, you got to get pressure with six. You've got to find a way to put pressure on the quarterback in a way that the Colts did not yesterday. And because they didn't put pressure on the quarterback, look at what Matty Ice did. 21 at 22 in the second half. Holy crap. Uh, Saturday night, I went to a wedding and I talked about this a little bit on Breakfast with Kent, but not at the length that it deserves. Uh, a guy named Kyle Miller got married. Kyle Miller is the son of Mike Miller, who was a high school basketball coach in central Indiana for a long time, coached at Burbuff. He was Alan Henderson's high school coach, went over to Lawrence Central and coached there for a good long time. And, and his son got married. And so at the wedding, you, you had a bunch of guys that Mike coached and a bunch of guys that Kyle played with his teammates, uh, guys that he played with in summer basketball, guys that he played with high school basketball, guys that he played both with. There were a lot of former student athletes there who played at Lawrence Central or played for the Speed Central Stars or played for uh, the Indy Wolves from fourth grade through eighth grade. And all I, I saw these guys all night long talking to each other, hugging each other, having a great time, and, and kind of catching up together. And it reminded me of what's really, really good about youth basketball. We kind of crap on youth basketball, don't we? And say, oh, my God, you know, it's, a, it, it's the Wild West out there, and the Adidas guys and the Nike guys, they're all paying people, and they got this, the shoe events, and so the shoe guys are all over the place, and they're talking to kids. And, and for God's sake, all these guys go to the shoes, and they're getting money, and this is a travesty. Look, that happens. But it happens to a very, very small percentage of the guys who are being recruited or the guys playing youth basketball. The other guys in youth basketball, here's the thing, all right? Parents who have kids who play youth basketball, what they need to understand is it's not about points per game. It's not about rebounds. It's not about missed blockouts. It's not about turnovers. It's not about playing time. It isn't about any of that kind of crap. What it's about is friendship and work ethic and developing an attitude of cooperation, and developing an attitude of respect for authority. These are the lessons that youth basketball instills. And with those lessons, if people take them seriously, people can live a really, really good, healthy, and functional life and and be very successful outside of the realm of basketball. Most of the kids playing youth basketball are not going to play in college. Some aren't even going to play in high school. And very, very few, a very small sliver of them are ever going to play in the NBA. And those kids, I'm telling you, at at sixth grade, you can see who's going to be in the NBA. You can absolutely see that. Every once in a while, there's a surprise. But if your kid, like if your kid does not look special, your kid as an athlete, your kid is not going to the NBA. So put that straight out of your head. That dream does not need to exist for 99% of the people who are playing youth basketball. What does need to exist is an understanding of those lessons and the friendships that can come from playing youth basketball. Basketball is a really unique sport in that everybody gets a chance to score. Everybody gets a chance to defend. It's not positionless, but it's far more positionless than football, and it's far more co- co- uh, cooperative than baseball. Baseball is really a series of one-on-one events. It's pitcher versus hitter, hitter versus pitcher, hitter versus fielder, runner versus fielder. You know what I mean? It's not nine guys playing against nine. It's one playing against one many, many times. Basketball is truly five on five, where all five have an opportunity to score, assist, 
rebound. Everybody needs to be able to do everything, and they need to be able to get the ball to the guy who's open so he can shoot and score. You know what I mean? It's about cooperation, and it's about listening to a coach and trusting a coach, and it's about listening to officials and trusting the officials. That's basketball, and really, that's life. That's about as close an approximation to what life in business is like that sports can provide. It's not like tennis. It's not like golf. It's not like baseball. And really, it's not like football. It's very much like basketball. And so when you play youth basketball and you play a bunch in the summer, and, and when my kid and, and Kyle and Drew Horman and Sean Malloy and Nate Blank and all these guys were playing either with or against each other, all the guys in the 2007 class, Eric Gordon, Jeff Teague, Etwan Moore, Robbie Hummel, Gary McGee, Antoine Boyd, uh, you had Dwan Squires, you had a bunch of Vinny Jackson, you had a bunch of really, really good guys, John Ashford, Zach Hahn, Matt Howard, the list goes on and on and on and on, Kyle McFadden. Anyway, all these kids, they worked really hard to push each other and compete against each other. But what really happened with that class is the, the, that air of competition drove work ethic and before the kids went to high school you had you had seventh and eighth graders playing about 250 games a year they played year round and that's when when I talk about Indiana basketball I'm kind of off ramping here for a minute when I talk about Indiana basketball and the the need for Indiana or Purdue or Butler or whomever to record Indiana this is why Michigan State recruits Indiana like crazy Because these kids know what they're doing on the basketball court. They have played so much basketball from fourth grade through eighth grade. They play over 1,000 games. That doesn't happen anywhere else. And in high school, you're playing in, in the summer. You're playing high school. You're playing with your high school in June. And then during the regular season, you're playing an insane amount of basketball. So by the time you get to college, you've played probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 games in your life or maybe a little bit more than that. And then multiply that by the number of practices, right, or add to that the number of practices, probably two practices for every game, and you're talking about maybe 12,000 hours of basketball being played at a relatively high level and the coaches in Indiana being as good as they are, you're getting really good leadership. Anyway, that's why you got to recruit Indiana well. But what youth basketball does, it doesn't necessarily prepare you to play in college. It doesn't, and it shouldn't. And it doesn't necessarily prepare you to play in the NBA, and it absolutely shouldn't because it's not within the physical bandwidth and athleticism of 99.8% of the people playing basketball. So it's not about that, and it sure as hell isn't preparing people to play in the FIBA World Cup in Japan earlier this month where the United States comes in seventh. People are blaming summer basketball for a lack of development of players in the United States, so we're having trouble competing at the international level. Who the hell cares? What are we out of our minds? We're going to judge a youth basketball system based upon the ability of 12 guys who are all making, you know, between 15 and $40 million a year to go to Japan and win a few games. That's crazy. What youth basketball needs to be evaluated upon, the metric that we need to look at, is who these kids are when they're 30 years old, when they become young men, when they become young professionals, when they become husbands and fathers. Who are these people and what has basketball done to facilitate their progression, either professionally or personally? That's the thing. And so when I went to Kyle Miller's wedding over the weekend and saw him with my son and, and saw Ryan was the best man and Nate Blank's there and, uh, you know, Stevie Hedrick is there and Drew Horman and Sean Malloy and all these guys, it's like, you know what? And you see these guys together, you're like, that's what it is, you dumbass. What were you worried about all this peripheral stuff? Why did you think about that? Why did you give any importance to that kind of, hey, you know, uh, call my parents. You know, Ryan scored 22. What the hell does that have to do with anything? Ryan is a really good dude, a really good friend, a really good husband, 
and so are all his friends. And it's phenomenal. It's great. And to see so many of these guys like Zach or like Ben Botts, John Ashworth, Nate Blank, go into coaching and kind of perpetuate the, the lessons, pay forward the lessons that, that they took from youth basketball is absolutely stupendous. That is how you look at youth basketball. That's the importance. It's not about scholarships, and it's not about who offered you, and it's not about how many points you scored or whether some guy's freezing your kid out. Your, your coach is an idiot because he just has your kid go run to the corner, and he never gets the ball, and it's, a, it's ridiculous. And all these opportunities are passing him by. It's absurd. We've got to do something. Stop that. Take a deep breath and understand that because of youth basketball in part, your kid, when he or she, for that matter, turns 30, all these lessons that they learned on the basketball court are going to flower and are going to propel them personally and professionally to a place that they wouldn't have been otherwise. All right, that's my screed on youth basketball. Don't tell me about the shoe guys. Don't tell me about points. Don't tell me about any of that crap. Understand that it's about life and becoming a good person and basketball helps. Where do the Cubs go from here? That's a hell of a question. Where do the Cubs go from here? Do you, do you let Madden go? Of course you let Madden go. Theo and Joe, they don't like each other. Theo wants to move on from Joe, and Joe, putting the Cubs in a position or being the manager of a team that is in the position, I guess, maybe a little more accurately, because this we can't all lay it at Joe Madden's doorstep, that has given Theo all the latitude he needs to go ahead and spike Joe Madden and bring in somebody like David Ross, uh, a more contemporary figure for these guys. You know, Larry Bird always said that three years, that's really the length of time that people are going to listen to a guy. And that's in basketball, granted, but I think it works in baseball too. And in 2015, it was kind of cool when Joe Madden would have all the guys on the team wear superhero outfits on, uh, on their road trips or Halloween costumes, or whatever the hell they dressed up as. That was kind of cool. Well, five years in, it's no longer cool. And I guarantee you to the players, the players are like, what the hell am I dressing up like this for? I just want to go to Pittsburgh and play baseball. Do we really have to dress up all the time? As you know, I got to, I got to dress as like, you know, this Superman again. What is happening? I have to dress as Scooby-Doo. Who, who's in charge? Who's running this ship? I just want to hit the baseball 480 feet. Can I just go do that? That's kind of where this team is. And you can see it in their play. In 2015, 16, and even 17, they were a good base running team. Now, the same exact guys are running the bases like barbarians. They're idiots on the bases. They made more outs on the bases than any other team in Major League Baseball. Defensively, they've gone from being a plus defensive team to not being a plus defensive team. Hey, it didn't help that uh, that Baez and uh, Rizzo were on the shelf for a good portion of this run. Actually, Rizzo, they kind of didn't miss because Rizzo, that was uh, during the series with the Pirates where they scored what they in, the, in that four game run against the Pirates and one game against the Reds. They scored fifty five runs. So Rizzo being out. Really didn't hurt. Baez being out did hurt because defensively they weren't the same, and then offensively they weren't the same either against the Cardinals. They've lost five games in a row that were decided by one run. Four of those were against the Cardinals, and now they go to Pittsburgh and hopefully beat the hell out of them. If they win all six games and somehow Milwaukee loses four of their last six, the Cubs, they got a chance. But man, that is. Uh, I don't think that's much of a chance. I think even if they sweep the Pirates, they're going to go to St. Louis, and I think St. Louis is going to have a hell of a lot of fun eliminating the Cubs. The Cubs, kind of the the uh, the popular kids, right, of the National League Central, and there is nothing more fun than beating the hell out of the popular kids and ending their season. So that is a pretty damn likely uh, occurrence, I think, for later in the week. Six games left in the regular season. I can't wait for it to end. I don't expect Joe Madden to be around long after the regular season. The Bears, Redskins tonight. The Bears, a a five-and-a-half-point favorite. 
If if you're not from Chicago or, or Washington, what the hell are you doing watching this game? Right? This is going to be a terrible football game. The Bears probably going to win, and they need to, because if they fall to one and two, they're going to be two full games behind the Green Bay Packers, and that's not good. You get to one and two, and people are going to start kind of saying things about Mitch Trubisky, and they would be right to say them. Because I, I don't, I, and I said this throughout the entire offseason. I listen to Chicago media a lot and watch Dave Kaplan and that, that little roundtable thing on NBC Sports Chicago. They're talking about the Bears as though they've got their ticket punched to go to the Super Bowl. I'm like, what the hell's the matter with you people? First of all, you have an attack-based defense that's being coordinated by Chuck Pagano. Second of all, you got Mitch Trubisky, a quarterback, and you may love the way his potential looks on paper, but that doesn't mean he's going to be able to win football games. All right, so, uh, and oh, bad news for the Indiana Hoosiers. Coy Cronk, of course, is going to be out for the season. All you had to do was watch the play that he was hurt on and see which way his foot was pointing after the contact that caused the injury, and you knew he was out for the year. There was no chance that a guy with his foot turned in the opposite direction is going to play football within the next couple of months. Just can't happen. The the Hoosiers, according to Tom Allen, a little bit earlier today, they have not decided whether Coy Cronk is going to be redshirted. Now you've got that thing, that four-game window, where you can decide to redshirt a guy after having him play for four games, we'll see if that happens. Uh, first things first, you got to support the kid through his surgery and into the nascent stages of his uh, of his rehab. Then you start thinking about the procedural stuff. And Tom Allen is saying again that maybe Michael Penix plays. I don't think he's playing. I think it's going to be Peyton Ramsey again. I think Michael Penix has a long term injury that the Hoosiers are not be, being totally transparent about. And by doing that, it makes a guy like Mark D'Antonio prepare for both Penix and Ramsey unless they've got the inside scoop on Penix's health. So there you go. But they play Michigan State this coming Saturday, 3.30 game time. Purdue plays Minnesota, 3.30 game time. Notre Dame plays Virginia, also 3.30 game time. What the hell is the matter with the scheduling people? Are you kidding me? I want to watch all these games, and I don't like watching games that are recorded. Anyway, Breakfast with Kent tomorrow. Cannot wait to talk to you then. 8 o'clock on Facebook Live, about 8.15 on Periscope Live. Join me, all brought to you by the great people at Today's Dentistry. Give them a call, 317-849-2933.